Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Christ is risen. My name is Kathy Martin, and I'm a member of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Burlingame. Whether you're visiting us for the first time online or you're a regular parishioner, I'd like to welcome you to today's online service. Please explore our website, stpaulsburlingame.org, for news, music, and helpful resources on spiritual growth and connections. Thank you for joining us today. Alleluia! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia! God be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and ever living God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the first letter of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed and we have seen it and testified to it and declared to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaimed to you, that God is light, 
and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice to our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. A reading from the Gospel according to John. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them, and he said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out with your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through that believing you may have life in his name. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people.
please join me in prayer. Gracious and loving God, help us this day to understand and celebrate your dream for the world, to be transformed in Jesus' love, and to use our gifts to make a difference for others. Amen. About every nine years, the Episcopal Church elects a new presiding bishop. And these bishops often create a tagline that follows them throughout their nine-year term. When I was growing up, Bishop, bishop Edmund Browning had a tagline that said, No Outcasts, as we were going through uh, pretty severe arguments about sexuality in the church. Our current presiding bishop, Michael Curry, has taken on the theme of the way of love. And that is the teaching that the way of Jesus is the way of love, which shouldn't be too surprising to us. That probably resonates with a lot of us. He would have gotten a great deal of inspiration and certainly was simpatico with John the Evangelist. And it's John the Evangelist's thought and witness that we hear today in both the gospel and the epistles, the letters from John. And for the next few weeks, we're going to be wandering around in those letters from John a little bit because they are the letters that point us to that way of love. In the letter we hear today, the very first part of the first letter of John, we can get a sense of where John is going and what is important to John. And the first thing that's important to John is life. So that letter starts with talking about receiving the life of God, the life, eternal life, the life that's always been there through Jesus so that we might find joy. He's simply echoing a, another part found in the gospel where Jesus compares the life he has to offer to a well springing up springing up to life with joy, springing up to life to give us what we really desire, to quench our thirsts. And so it's that kind of exuberant, joyful life, that kind of life that rises up in us and gives us what the scripture calls the peace that passes understanding. It's that gift that John is all about, the gift of of life. And the currency for John is the way of love. The way that we give and receive this life is by spending and receiving love. And if we can be believers who live in love, then we will find that life that John is so excited about. John has another theme, and that's that people often turn away from this life for some reason. They seek to find life in other places. They seek to use a different currency. Maybe that currency is uh, wealth or celebrity or power. But these currencies don't lead to the kind of life that John is talking about. These currencies, when we turn to them and depend on them to find life, that's what John would even call sin. It's turning away from true life. There was a great example of this a couple of years ago when Bishop Curry, whose theme is the way of love, preached at the royal wedding of Harry and Meghan, who've also been in the news a bit lately. Perhaps you watched it, but there was a lot of currency going on in that wedding. As, uh, as the show started, and it certainly seemed like a show, you saw all these people dressed up, all these people with these different currencies to try to find some kind of approximation of life. There were the women with the amazing hats. Wow. To see and be seen. 
when the announcers were noticing the wedding, what were they talking about? The celebrities that were there, the famous people with reputation. There were the dignified men with coats with many medals hanging on the side. Even Harry himself was wearing a coat with many medals hanging down on the side. There was the queen being very proper. And the most dressed up and the most proper were the Anglican clergymen. So proud to see them. My brothers, uh-oh, I think they were all brothers, gathered there for that great wedding. But there was one clergyman, our very own Michael Curry, who was the preacher that day. Michael Curry stood up, and he began to preach about love, which seems natural at a wedding, doesn't it? And so he started talking about Meghan and Harry and, and love. And then he really got going. And he began to preach about the way of love and about how the whole world needed to, to, to rest itself in love. He began to speak about the currency of love. And the cameras couldn't help but pan out over the congregation that day. All those people dressed in fine hats and coats with fancy medals to see how they were responding to this explosion of life in the pulpits, preaching about love. Now, perhaps these people didn't spend enough time in church, and I imagine some of them spent too much time in church. Because instead of being enlivened by this preaching, by this promise of the true life that's found when one rests in God's love, there were embarrassed looks from people who spent so much time cultivating their careful image. There was the stoic seriousness of the clergyman who sat right behind Michael Curry. And Michael Curry is exploding with joy, and the stoic clergyman sits quietly and very seriously because that's what one ought to do when one is behaving properly in church. And so there, in that moment, a wedding, which should mostly be about love, people sat wrapped in all those different currencies that they hope, that they trust in, that they count on to bring them some kind of life or value in life. And aside from Harry and Meghan and some of the singers and a few of those crazy Americans, maybe even Elton John was there who, who laughed and who had a sparkle in their eye. For some reason, out of all those people, the thing you wouldn't have said was happening was joy and life. And that's the tragedy for John when he writes to the Christians. The tragedy is, is that they have forgotten, perhaps, the great gift of life. That is what Jesus comes to bring. And they've forgotten the currency of love. So John says, smart man that he is, John says, you know, all of us turn away sometimes. None of us perfectly rests either in trusting that God is the true source of all life or none of us trusts quite enough in that to simply deal in the currency of love. We have our other currencies that we use to somehow try to buy life or receive life. And so John simply says, you know, Nobody is perfect, but we can, when we know, take off the hat, take off the medals, 
take off the vestments, and simply confess that we turn away sometimes. And in doing so, put ourselves back in the grace of God. Put ourselves next to the well that's just seeking to well up with God's life. So John begins this wonderful meditation on the way of love that we'll be hearing about for the next few weeks. He begins this meditation with an invitation to take off those things that we count on to earn life. To confess that the life only comes from a real trust in God. To name those places that we think might lead us to life or that we're habitually trained into thinking will bring us life. To take off those places and name those places so that we might know the life that is the gift from God. I'm really glad that we have a presiding bishop now, Michael Curry, who has called us back to a way of love. And I'm grateful that we have this time together in the next few weeks to think about the way of love and to rest in the life that we have been given, especially in this Easter tide. So I invite you to take a little bit of time this week to think about what is truly life-giving, to think about what hats you're wearing or what medals you're wearing or what celebrity you're seeking, and to turn away from those currencies and spend the currency that really matters, the currency of love. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Mark, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. We give thanks especially for those who work to prepare such a wonderful Holy Week and Easter. Pray for the Church. I ask your prayers for peace for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. As we receive the gift of new vaccines in our own nation, we pray for just and compassionate sharing among the nations of the world. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. We pray for those in any need or trouble. This week, we especially pray for Jim Hansen, 
Bonnie Merrick, Christopher, Joan Verlingo, Linda McLaughlin, Diane Miller, The Forest Family, Michelle Sloat, and Susan Lawson, Billy Young, Banafshe, Laura Cope, John and Arlene Borgeson, Nate Price, Michelle Blair, Nan Casulos, Tom Bryce, Renee and Bern Kim, Wally Clevishaw, Jim Prescott, and the Murdoch family, especially Charlotte. I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. Good and gracious God, listen to the prayers that we have brought here to you this day. And we ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. And now, let us all pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. May the blessing of God, who, when we doubt, says, come, put your hands in my side, come see for yourself, be with you all, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. May we all remain one, alleluia.